Hi. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, we've got a wonderful panel, I hope, for you. Um, and we're going to spend the next 20 minutes uh, talking about artificial intelligence and innovation in AI uh, beyond big tech and what that means. Um, and um, just to, to maybe set the scene, um, I'm Ludwig Enstahl. I'm with 468 Capital. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, developments in artificial intelligence and investing in it. And um, I think one of the things that we're increasingly excited about and that we think will become even more you know, transparent and obvious um, uh, to the world than it is uh, uh, today is that artificial intelligence has um, obviously touched a lot of the digital world, right? Large language models, protein folding, those are the big topics that we see in the news um, uh, every day. But what is happening right now, uh, at least we think, is is a shift of artificial intelligence that actually touches the physical world, right? So AI to power the physical, the 3D world, and, and sort of the big applications um, that arise there. And um, I'm extremely happy and uh, honored that we have three perfect examples of that, of, of young companies that we work with that are all using artificial intelligence to, to build physical world, real world applications. Um, Balint, Christian, Andreas, thanks so much for being here uh, uh, today. And um, I'm just going to start with a quick round. Why don't you? Then I go first. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ludwig. Yeah, so my name is Bantar Kuti. I'm the CEO of Surrogate. And at Surrogate, the physical world that we touch with AI is your brain. We developed a brain computer interface and a neuromodulation system that helps patients with Parkinson's disease, patients with balance disorders, and builds a communication link between machines and the nervous system, both in the brain and the spinal cord. And we've been using AI really from day one to accomplish this goal, and I've already successfully tested it in 80 human patients. Mm. I'm Christian. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Katkin. Uh, Katkin is a software company that develops AI-based um, self-driving technology for transport robots. Um, typical applications, uh, last mile delivery of food or parcels or groceries. Or on the industrial side, we also have a lot of tasks where we shuttle goods on factory premises, um, indoors and outdoors. And I'm Andreas, um, I'm CEO of Jua. We develop what we call a large physics model. Currently, we use it to predict weather for energy traders. Um, the challenge is renewables are increasing. Uh, therefore, it's increasingly hard to predict exactly how much power your assets will produce and what the power price will be in a certain time in the future. So the reliance on um, accurate but also fast and frequent weather forecasts um, is going up and we help energy traders solve that problem. So we've got AI to build better brain computer interfaces to do autonomous driving and to predict the weather. So I think uh, three pretty big problems and questions you're going after. Andreas, maybe we start with you. Tell us where we at in terms of predicting the weather at the precision that we uh, um, all, all dream of having it versus five years ago, versus 10 years ago. Is AI going to be a big game changer here relative to numerical models? And, and what do we know already what's working and what's not? Yeah, I, I personally think we're in the most exciting time since the beginning of weather predictions. But uh, the reason for that is that I think in the last five years, um, opportunities have come up that have created the opportunity, uh, the, sorry, uh, the underlying technologies have developed that have created the opportunity that, that we're capitalizing on, which is, uh, you know, the launch costs for satellites have gone down um, exponentially, which means there is now exponentially more data becoming available that we can um, leverage. Uh, there is also uh, the increase in compute capacity and at the same time the uh, development of the deep learning stack overall. And with all these things combined, um, it's now possible to you know, significantly outperform uh, historical weather forecasts um, with pure deep learning approaches, no longer you know, using any of the uh, historic models. Um, to put that into numbers, uh, what we're seeing in the lab at the moment or in our devel at, at development stage and what we're bringing to market 
is an increase in accuracy that's equivalent to roughly the last 10 years of improvement in all of the global meteorological community's efforts um, combined. And we think we're going to have another year like that ahead of us. So there is a, an, a step change, a real step change in accuracy, speed, in all the dimensions that are valuable for customers. Yeah. And um, if you, you know, project the next five years, are you going to be um, making uh, advances because of more compute, because of more models, um, because of leveraging new, new hardware, such as the satellites? What's going to be driving your, your field and your project of, of weather prediction in particular? So I think, I think there are <laughs> there pretty much all of this, right? So I think there is a huge scope to still just upsize the model architectures we have today. I think there's also a lot of innovation happening on the level of model architecture itself. Uh, and at the same time, uh, data is also increasing. So um, the, the not only increasing, but also the, the density of measurements is going up. The frequency of measurements is going up. Um, so I think there is, there's progress happening on, on all of those. Um, and then further to that, with the architecture that we've chosen, we can also use data that was previously not even usable at all. So we're tapping into a completely new pool of, of, of data, like uh, your billions of IoT sensors that were not that were not used for modeling the atmosphere or other Earth systems before. So, so yeah, I don't think it's one right. of those. I think it's all of those that are that are on an exponential curve at the moment. It's very fascinating. Thank you, uh, uh, Christian. Briefly on your field, self-driving. I think it's been uh, uh, through many hype cycles and disappointment cycles. Um, but now something seems to have changed. I was in the first uh, self-driving car in San Francisco three weeks ago. Um, uh, Tesla just announced um, a billion fully self-driven miles. We heard the massive funding announcement here in London for Wavy. And of course, you are also uh, very active um, with your self-driving uh, uh, vehicles to customers in Japan uh, for Uber Eats um, and, and in the United States um, and for, for many, many uh, big corporates in Europe. What's changing right now? Where are we with fully autonomous driving? What, why, is, why are people suddenly waking up that, that uh, there's been uh, these massive developments? Um, you've probably known it all along. Take us through your view of the field right now and uh, in the next five years. Yeah, um, me and my co-founder, one of my co-founders were actually working on self-driving cars back in the 2000s. So we saw the whole hype cycle. Everybody thought it was like five years away. Google started their self-driving car project. And then people realized, like, oh, this is, is really, really hard. But what has changed, um, so it was like this is now almost 20 years ago. So what has changed over the last five years is really particular for us, the amount of compute on the edge you can fit in a, in a robot or in a car in a vehicle. And that allows you to run co completely different level of algorithms, like much more capable AI models that can deal with like, the complexities much better of the, of the real world. It's, like, it's complicated to drive. It's like there's a lot of decisions. You need to process a lot of data. You have to be more capable. Um, and this has made like a um, basically being able to have a lot of compute and a small form factor in a robot, so it still has like a day of battery life. It's like wasn't enabling technology for us that happened over the last two or three years that was not possible five years ago. If you project that out, okay, it's like now we have this like you know the first commercial robot taxis out in San Francisco and Phoenix with Waymo, like we are commercializing like these robots, like our robots are doing several tens of thousands of deliveries every, every month. Like where does this, this go? It's like what we're actually doing right now is collecting a lot of data to improve our models. We, like, we use AI in our mapping to make the mapping more automated. So it's like that is basically an accelerator to roll out um, robotics or self-driving technology on, on a bigger scale. So it doesn't have to be like handcrafted anymore in one geofenced area, where it's like you have, you know, you tweak a lot of things. So it's like the question is like, how do you get it from like Phoenix or San Francisco to like all of the US or all of Japan? Um, so AI is like 
fundamental in that to, to accelerate that process. Now it's in Phoenix, it's in San Francisco. You have it um, uh, uh, for food delivery and uh, delivery of other goods and services. When are we all going to have it available to us uh, uh, all over the world? How long do you think is it going to take? And what are the big hurdles? And everyone who looks at the field has their own take. What's, what's your take? <laughs> what's the biggest three obstacles to overcome? So like the joke is, it's like always five to 15 years away, depending where you are, but it's It, it has changed, so I think we're, we're commercializing it. We're like rolling it out. We're still trying to figure out. It's more on the operational side, actually, than some on the tech, technology side. Like on self-driving cars, you need to figure out like where can cars park to let people out. Like you don't want to have um, self-driving cars violate traffic rules and, and double park as an Uber driver does. So there's like some of that being figured out. Um, I think from a technology point of view, it's really about like the scaling. How do we find patterns and a scalable process to roll this out. And I will say there's like different areas have different regulation hurdles. Um, US tends to be a little, um, I wouldn't say Wild West, that's, that's the wrong thing, but it's like it's a little bit more open, there's like less rules than maybe in Germany. Um, but what we actually have seen is like a lot of um, regulators see the potential now, they, they see You know, this is a coming technology that's actually helpful, like for our for our robots, for instance, it helps their constituents to get deliveries cheaper and more environmental. Um, that they are very open to it. So Japan just last year passed legislation to allow sidewalk robots on their streets. Korea followed, South Korea followed in November. I think in in Europe that will come too, but it, the timeline may shift a little bit. Yeah. Um, are we behind in Europe very much on the regulatory? and policy side versus other geographies? Because your delivery robots, uh, you're a Munich-based company, yeah. but your robots are live in the United States and in Japan, and not on German or French yeah. roads. So that's an issue, right? That is a bit of an issue. We did have one robot in Hamburg once, but on an exception permit. But that's the thing, right? It's like there's a general understanding this needs to happen and support, but it's not you still have to follow a lot of process and a lot of regulations. And it's like, there's no real pass for, uh, not real pass, like an easy pass immediately to scale and roll this out all, all over Germany. Um, UK is actually a little bit more open. Um, so here we have some robots running in, in Milton Keynes um, doing parcel delivery. Um, so I think it's going to be changing, but you know, continental Europe could, yeah. could learn maybe a little bit from Japan. <laughs> Fantastic. Valent, tell us about brain-computer interfaces and AI. So when, when people, you know, in, in your field, um, uh, you know, you have one competitor that's uh, grabbing a lot of headlines, uh, Neuralink, they're doing a great job. What few people know is that you're, uh, you know, already your devices are in the brains of many, many patients already. How many? 80. Uh, 80 patients worldwide. And um, so you have a lot of real-life data of using machine learning and AI to improve the interface of machines with brains. Tell us about it. Yes. How are you doing it? So if you basically compare the Neuralink timeline, they need about a team of 12, 15 people who worked on this first patient who received the uh, device for eight, nine days every day. It's an eight to nine hour calibration session. So they need to work to set up the device for it to decode the brain activity correctly. Our approach uses about one hour with one patient to get to the point where the patient can utilize the interface sufficiently. And that is enabled by the power of um, AI, by the power of using machine learning on proprietary data sets that we have acquired in many clinics around the world. Mm -hmm. And so our field is being reluctantly, in some cases, dragged along by consumer tech. Mm -hmm. So in the 1990s, if you got a pacemaker or a brain implant, a cable would dangle out of your skull and the tech would come and connect it with a serial port, set it up on time, implant it, and goodbye, and then it doesn't change whether you're sleeping, running, stalking, doing woodwork. It would never adapt. And today, we have Bluetooth. You can control your device, your brain implant, from your phone. We have connectivity to the cloud. So during COVID, it started that patients can be now remotely programmed by doctors, and in that sense, they, this remote connectivity allows us to also recalibrate and readjust these devices over their entire life cycle. And these are fundamentally new things that have changed the playing field completely. 
And uh, here we are very excited about this development because Elon Musk and uh, gang do a lot of basically the baseline marketing for this field. So everybody <laughs> gets super excited and he promises a lot of stuff on, on Twitter slash X. But we make real fundamental progress that has a huge medical impact for individuals. And if we want to go from helping a few dozen patients per year, which is currently the case in many clinics, to helping thousands or millions, the devices have to be autonomous. They have to become self-programming, self-calibrating. And this is a highly regulated field, as you can imagine, a lot of laws, a lot of clinical trials. But that's also why it's so rewarding, because if we get it right, we can make an incredible impact for, for many people. Again, asking you the, the five-year horizon question, what will the, uh, the mix of, of these hardware devices and the AI be able to do five years from now in terms of uh, um, you know, either helping patients with a disease or even enhancing our brain capacity you know, on, a, on a five, maybe a 10 year horizon? What's, what's possible and, and what will be done in, in, in your opinion? Yes. Take us through a few use so cases. So basically in the next one to two years, we will have the commercial um, approval of the first BCI. That is certain. There are five main contenders. We will have them come through and that means it will start to commercialize. We'll see people either dominate a niche or be able to scale out of their specific clinical indication niche. And on the back of that trend, we'll see more and more interest in getting the surgery better, getting it more streamlined. We want to get to the point where this is like LASIK. You walk into the boutique, you have it done, you go home in the evening. Today, brain surgery is not like that. Yeah. But it is poised to be like that in five to 10 years. And when we get to that point, because planning has become better, because it takes less time from busy nurses and doctors to set up your devices correctly, then all of a sudden we can really scale. And I, I'm very certain that we're going to see that. So similarly, like a cosmetic surgery emerged from burn victim uh, surgery of the skin, we'll also see something like cosmetic brain surgery and cosmetic brain modulation, either to augment or to modify things that we probably today would not elect to be medically modifiable. This will have an impact in cognition, in intelligence, in emotion regulation. You think we'll be yeah. able to measurably increase our intelligence by these devices? Absolutely, absolutely. So we already succeeded in connecting um, basically AI systems in a way that help people solve problems they couldn't solve by themselves, which is absolutely fundamental. And, Give uh, us an example. Well, we did a study where we uh, literally connected ChatGPT. So we had ChatGPT ask a question, um, uh, basically, of the patient. I think the question was, what is the, uh, the link between string theory and black holes? So a question I think no one here would know the answer to. And it was designed to be unanswerable. And then instead of providing the answer, we sent the answer directly into the spinal cord. The patient was able to interpret the message, similar to Braille writing for the blind. And then he said, yeah, the answer is A, and then write, wrote it down on a piece of paper. And for us, this was the watershed moment. That's where everybody in the room like, was <gasps> holding their breath and, and uh, saying, this is, this is something novel, and that, that has the potential to really be impactful. And um, what will have to happen? You know, what, what, what are the, the, the biggest obstacles, uh, if, if any? What's the, what's the crucial point that will have to happen on the breakthrough level? Is it on the surgery front, um, on the model front? Yeah, so I, I worked for like seven, eight years in the neurosurgical domain trying to get the surgery better. That is a component, but the reality is that the programming has to get better because the nurses and the doctors simply don't have time for pre-care and after-care. If one patient takes you a month to program, you're not going to do uh, um, hundreds of patients a year. So the, if the devices get smarter and smarter, then we'll see real scalability. So I think a lot of the value creation chain of the future is going to be in software and these types of artificial intelligence augmentations. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, as much as I did. And um, we, we, we just got five, six, seven minute um, summaries of what, what we think, what I think are three of the most exciting uh, uh, projects in, in tech in Europe. And um, thank you so much for being here on stage with me. Thank you for being here and uh, hope to see you at the conference later. Thanks you. Well, thank you so much to the panel.